The following program is produced by the Tech Talk Radio Network. Hi, this is Colin Mockery of Whose Line Is It Anyway? You're listening to Tech Talk Radio. I don't know how it works. It's all magical stuff to me. Welcome to another episode of Tech Talk Radio. I'm Andy Taylor. I'm Sean DeWeer. And we are the show that talks about computers, technology, and the internet. I'm just going to throw this little fact out there. Max's first birthday is this weekend. Are you kidding me? Already? <laughs> one year old already. Wow. So what do you, what do you get a wow. one-year-old that's into, uh, well, when dad's into tech, what is... What does he give a one-year-old for his birthday? Toys that light up and make cool sounds. I don't know. <laughs> I've thrown around the idea of making him one of those gadget boards, a project box, and yeah. then putting switches and stuff and make it rechargeable so it can light up and stuff. I've thought about doing one of those. That would be kind of cool. He'd have fun with that. He, he loves, we we had we ended up buying him a, a, a Roku remote because he always wanted to have the remote. Really? Because he figured out that if he pushes buttons on the remote, it changes things on the TV. <laughs> Wait, at one? He's already figuring this out? So, oh, he's, this has been months he's been doing this. We've been watching Bluey, which is a uh, popular uh, Australian show. Yeah. He loves it. He knows when the episode ends and then it's silent. So he would he will, he would will crawl over to the remote if he had it on the floor and then turn around and wave it at the screen expecting it to go to the next episode. Oh, man. <laughs> so instead of him chewing up and slobbering all over our remote we bought him one off amazon for like four bucks or something so now he has his own now do you, you put the batteries in it and everything so no no no, 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 no. <laughs> we don't we don't have the batteries in it but it's that it's that time in his in his development where he anything that we're doing so he knows that when the episode changes we're doing it with the remote he sees it in our hand and so he knows that that's what does that we ended up getting our grandson who uh, they're around the same time uh he's now well he's a little older he's uh, maybe a year and four four or five months, we got him a tablet uh, designed for kids. And I don't remember what the manufacturer was. There's so many out there, but apparently he's having fun with it. Shapes and, you know, colors and doing that kind of stuff. But honestly, he'll play with it for maybe 10, 15 minutes. And then he wants to go play with a ball or do stuff like that. It, it, yeah. Max, Max plays with everything. Yeah. He's got, we've got all sorts of toys for him. And one day he'll want to just play with some blocks. I, I've been using my 3D printer again. And so I had an empty PLA spool. Right. And he, that, he, he just was like, what is this thing? And was just all over it. He just was letting it roll across the floor. And so I didn't even think about that with a 3D printer. You can actually make toys. And I'm sure there's templates out there to make toys for kids to oh, play I, with. Oh, I'm sure there are. I, I'm not sure you know how safe it is for kids to have that in their mouth and stuff but oh yeah yeah probably not good <laughs> i don't know i don't know i haven't 3d printed any toys we wouldn't recommend did, that at all i did i did the reason i fired up my 3d printer is we bought some some gate baby gates and uh it's more of like a play pen like you can connect them all together and make a big circle but they connect together with a post and, a, and somebody had 3d printed the posts so i can mount it to my wall so then oh. I can just I can hook them together and connect block off sections of a room or whatever. So I've three D printed about four of those, and I was able to mount them throughout my house. So I can just move those gates around and plop them into certain spots in the house instead of having to connect them together to have two. And then they don't fit, or it's too wide, or it's weird. Now I can just can drop it right onto the wall. Now for anybody thinking about getting a three D printer, which is the one you ended up getting? And I, you've had it for a couple the, of years now, right? Yeah, I've had it since. Christmas of 2020 uh, and, and Ender, Ender 3. The Ender 3. And that one, Ender 3 version 1. That one was recommended. It seemed like we saw a whole bunch of stuff when it came out to 3D printers. Uh, you would find them in Sam's Club. You could find them, you know, by, by ordering. And then it kind of got, it's kind of like it goes in waves. We saw 3D printers come out. That became huge. And then it was back to drones. And, and, and I've seen more people now starting to work with the 3D printers again seeing a lot of videos online of hey how to make this and how to make that. Yeah, I mean there there's a there was a steep learning curve, right? It's it's you can't just you have to have a little bit of a tech mind, right? You can't just go buy a 3D printer and say, I'm going to go print stuff to hang on my wall. Right. Well, it took me I had to watch a bunch of YouTube videos to get it set up and it took me some trial and error and then there's the whole learning curve and there's the testing and printing the benchy and it was a lot of work to get it going. Once I got it going, then I understood it, right? And then I was able to follow some tutorials and download some prints. I've modeled a couple of my own prints, just basic. I can't 3D model to save my life. <laughs> but uh, there's 
it's the internet. Yeah. Somebody's already designed it. So why take the time to design it? Somebody's already done it. You know, it, is this like kind of like a shared resource or is that something, you know, you go on, you find something, you go, Oh, cool. And then you pay them for that design. Uh, there's b- both. Right. So some people will, if they design something cool, they will put it behind a paywall. There are sites that allow you to do that, but Thingiverse, uh, a couple other uh, websites out there that have 3d printing resources available and, that's how I found this uh, 3D gate, 3D baby gate thing was just, I just went on there and Googled or searched within Thingiverse, the brand of the baby gate and it popped right up. Some of my friends uh, in broadcasting have actually made headphone stands, which um, have been great. And they've shared it with others as well, because, you know, you usually you lay your headphones on the desk or you hang them over a microphone, but actually having a stand that you could just mount them on and you can buy them. But they say, you know, doing it yourself is kind of a, a fun way. And you can actually have multiple colors. You can give a little extra to the design, maybe even hang your, you know, a smartwatch or whatever on it, depending on how you design it. You can really kind of go all out with that. Yeah, I've 3D printed all sorts of stuff. I kind of went I kind of went crazy when I first got it. And I 3D printed controller holders. I printed stuff for my <laughs> RV. I printed stuff for work i printed stuff for my a10 mini the stand for my a10 mini that's right here is 3d printed you know i kind of was printing everything i I 3d printed a huge charizard right i i 3d printed all sorts of stuff but yeah i remember i kind of just just do it for a while did the big thor hammer that was like one of the big projects yeah justin 3d printed it in like six different pieces and stuck it all together and fusioned it you know heated it up and fusioned it together and turned out really cool for him yeah yeah now, are, are they still relatively expensive? Have they come down in price, you know, since we've seen them come out? I mean, you haven't you know, probably I think, shopped. I think mine was just under 300 bucks. They and, are currently $206. So they've come down almost 100 bucks. Yeah. For somebody who wants to do it. Like I said, you know, there for was. A, for a very, this is a very generic, you know, four millimeter nozzle. But your basic, basic of the, you know, your build plate's only 12 inches by 12 inches. You're not going to be able to print huge things, right? It's going to take you six to eight hours to print a basic thing, right? It's like, And then if it screws up, you got to do it all over again. Oh, yeah. If it screws up or you don't level your build plate or, you know, it runs out of filament halfway through or, you know, something, right? It's I've kind of caught all of those issues, right? <laughs> so, you know, it'll start what they call, they call it spaghetti, right? Because if it gets we- if it gets weird and it doesn't adhere properly, it'll start just looking like spaghetti and, <laughs> and it kind of goes all over the place. It's hilarious. Now, when you, uh, so say you, you have this Ender 3 and then you, you say, okay, well, I'm not going to use it for a little while. You could take the nozzles off. You could clean them. So that way, when you want to use them, you don't run into the problem. Like if you have, you know, an inkjet printer, and you haven't used it for a while, people are always surprised that, you know, they've got this printer and they they try to use an inkjet for printing onto paper and they haven't used it for months and they don't get a really good print out of it because the nozzles clog up. Yeah, the, the nozzle, you know, the nozzle clogs up. It's not ink, right? So it doesn't dry up, but it can burn or it can get kind of funky. But uh, I just ran some filament through it. He got it, you know, heated it up, heated the element up and pushed some uh, some filament through it and then leveled my build plate and we were off to the races again. So nice. I was actually very pleasantly surprised. I hadn't used it in six to eight, eight months probably. And it took me about an hour of leveling the build plate and running a couple tests and fig- you know, it wasn't he- adhering to the bed plate. And then I was just leveling it, leveling it. And finally it started sticking and I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, started printing and it was fine. And I just, I printed a handful of these things and, I'll probably just print a couple fun things now that I, I pr- printed what I wanted. And I think it's a first on the show this week that we, we need to talk about this because wise W Y Z E.com. You can find them on the web. Uh, they've introduced recently uh, kind of a new line or a new model of their very popular cameras. For those who've been thinking about getting security outdoors or indoors. Um, we've talked about wise before, you know, they, they make a great solution and they have other products and they continue to announce products. You actually just showed me a product. I had no idea that they were, they were making. Yeah. So this, this probably got released, uh, less than a week, less than a week ago as the recording of the show. So March 5th or 6th, I think. Right. Yeah. And uh, they also have a really bang buster deal. If you're listening to the show, uh, go online and check their, their wireless 
noise canceling headphones are like are like sixty percent off or something stupid. Wow! And they were like thirty five dollars. And yeah. I love the their their wireless ear noise canceling headphones. I love them. They're super comfortable. I wear them around the house when I'm doing chores at night. So I don't, you know, I'm listening to a show or I'm listening to music. So I don't wake up Caitlin. And I love them. They're comfortable. They have great fidelity. And the battery life has been phenomenal. Right. So I'm just on the web and I got an email saying, why is wireless gaming headset? A gaming what? headset. Okay. Gaming headset. Great. I've had this. I've had these Steel Series Arctic 7s for. Oh. Six years, I think now, right? And they're, yeah. they're great. I Steel, love the headphones. Right? Steel Series the mic, the... makes some great, great headphones. They really yeah. do. So you know, th this is has this this one I'm wearing right now. You can't see it, but it, it, I, I'm not using the mic on the headset right now. It's got a retractable mic, sticks out, and you can slide it in, slide it out. It's got two channels of return audio, right? So there's a there's a game setting and a chat setting, and I can roll a knob on the back to filter in or out the game sounds or the audio sounds, right? This headset's great. So I was like, you know, what the hell? I really liked the, uh, their noise canceling headphones, their wireless, noise, their, their, whatever, their wireless pros yeah. or whatever they call them. Plus I have their earbuds, their wireless ear noise canceling earbuds too. Their pro earbuds. I love those too. Right. So I was like, you know what? The wise gaming headset, it's $34 or whatever it is. That's a bit because so let's face it. Why is that for gaming? 59, heads, 59 bucks, 59 bucks. Gaming headsets can start anywhere on the low end, about 120, 130, and then go all the way up to three, four hundred dollars, depending on which ones you get. Yeah. So I saw them 59 bucks. I was like, you know what? Uh, maybe I'm in the market for a new wireless headset. So I pulled the trigger, got here in two days. And I put them on, and I was like, wow, these aren't that comfortable. Mm. Ooh. And then I turned them on. Sound great. Right. The audio sounds great. Actually, I'm going to pull them up so you guys can see All right. where I put them. All right. Right down to your right. There so you I'm go. going to do okay. a quick breakdown, right? So here's the box. Wise, right. Wireless gaming headset, right? Okay. On the box, it says multi-source connection, right? It's got a it's got a 2.4 gig dongle you can plug in, or you can just connect via regular Bluetooth, so I can connect it to my phone. Uh, it says ultra low latency. So what I liked about it when I first saw it is that it you could I could take the dongle and I could plug it into my Xbox. Hmm. Plug it into my PlayStation. Plug it into my Switch and have wireless so I I will probably use it for that. Right. But I'm not going to use it to sit at my computer and play games. It did, it wasn't comfortable. There that I don't know if it's what a was, different ear what mold. Was, was it the ear the ear itself or the it's, over the head? It's it's, it's it's just a more it's a more it's a more stiff uh padding i don't know it's not the same it doesn't feel like the same padding as their as their uh the the noise canceling headphones they have right but it just it didn't fit comfortably it was very weird they fit over my ears which was nice right they're the over the ears right but they didn't fit it was just a weird fit it just didn't i don't know maybe i have to wear it some more but yeah i was wondering and, I, I, normally like I, i've got the sennheisers and i love them uh Honestly, once I put them on, I was in love with them because, it was, oh, these are great. Uh, every single one of my headphones in our studio in the office is Sennheiser. And it, we're, I'm just happy with the sound and the comfort in them. Because remember, I wear headphones about six, seven hours a day. So yeah. that, that was kind no, of I important. Get that. But I'm wondering, you know, is there a break in period? Normally there isn't on headphones. Right. There's not. Right. So the, the, Noise canceling ones I have didn't didn't have a breaking period. They just they've been comfortable since I put them on. Um, so what I like about this one though is that there's some of the things that I like, but most more often mostly I'm just a little disappointed. Right? It it left a lot to be desired mm -hmm. compared to my Steel Series. Right, I wish they would have the two channels so I could split between chat and game. They don't single channel, right? So it's only one audio source to the headset. Right now. It's more than likely because it's designed to go across multiple platforms, right? It's designed to be on a PC. It's designed to be in an Xbox, be on a, a PlayStation. It's not just designed for a PC, which the Steel Series are. So that's a little that's a that's a con, right? For this, the microphone, according to my friends on Discord, yeah, it was clipping. Oh. It, it it was it was. Uh, that a, that's it was a doing a weird. Thing. It was like it, as soon as I would peek, like if I talked loud, it would clip and get garbled, and it just didn't sound good to them. 
and I, I went in, adjusted settings and, and adjusted it and, you know, updated the drivers and I, I reset the headphones and stuff and just nothing I could do would make the microphone. I would say it's a two out of 10, right? The, in, I'm going to show it to you, but it's got, so it's got this boom, little boom mic on it. Right. That's got about a, out. that's about a, what a uh, five to six inch arm on that. Oh, that but does. It's, deta- it's detachable. It, so it's got detach. the three and a, three, three and a half millimeter plug. So when it's unplugged, it uses the mic that's built in like a normal set of over the ear headphones would have for like on your phone. Right. So if I was using this, these with my phone, I don't have to have the boom sticking out and I could travel with them or have them connect to my phone or whatever, or use them as a normal set of headphones. Right. Um, but they don't have noise canceling either. Oh, so I was a little bummed about that. Yeah. Cause for the price of the other ones, I, I would much rather spend 20 more dollars and get a pair of the noise canceling ones. Then get it, get it, get get, get these. So uh, a little left to be desired uh, for these, um, but the battery life has been good. I, I did test them for a full day. Like I, I tested right. them. I said I'm going to do it, and then towards the end of, you know, I played games for like six or seven hours the other the other day on my day off. I switched back to my Steel Series because the it, it started to hurt my ears. They were, you know, my my friends were just saying, you know, we were done dealing with you. Cl- the mic, it sounds like garbage it's clipping it you know like i would get excited playing games or i would talk loud and it would clip and it would get distorted so uh for 59 bucks i'm a little disappointed yeah i think i haven't logitech, tried it with my playstation or my xbox or anything yeah, logitech like that yet tech makes a gaming headset that's not that expensive not that much more money than that i know that they are super comfortable and the quality doesn't doesn't clip on the mic. Now I'm wondering one of the things about the Logitech is, is the software. You know they have a special suite of software for their their head headphones. Is it is there software to control that? Because maybe that headphone needs to be adjusted. No, there's it's just a dongle that connects to the dongle. That's I couldn't find it. There's no no software on the Wise. No software Wise website. that comes in. You know. Uh, the kind of the features they have listed are it's got the the, the, the low latency it says 20 hours of battery life that's two, pretty good two microphones right you can unplug it and get the one internally or have the built-in or the, like the boom feature. mic uh dedicated mute button which stuck it's awkwardly placed and didn't is it actually it's on the it headset work. itself it, yeah it's, it's on the headset on the back side right so you just reach up and touch behind your left ear but it it was intermittent if it worked oh i would press good. it and it and it's 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 not and if you just reach back and grab it you're like oh wait am i muted am i not right am I, like if i mute my steel series and i can do it right if i mute this yeah it lights up okay i see that so then you there's know no you're, indication you're there's no indication on this that you're muted it doesn't light up it doesn't it's not a very tactile button uh so just uh, like i said uh, there are a decent pair of headphones. Right. But I'm not going to give up my Steel Series for these. There you go. Well, that's, I mean, Steel... that's, that's my summary, right? I'm, I'm not giving up my six and a half year old Steel Series. Now, granted, the sound, they did sound better. Than the Steel but, Series? You know, yeah, they sound, well, these are also been, you know, these have been driven for six and a half years, right? right. The audio drivers could, you know, they're, who knows, right? So these are brand new 50, you know, 50 millimeter or whatever. Yeah, 50 millimeter audio drivers near. And they sound good, good bass response, good mids, good high, you know, just a good dynamic rate. And they sounded good, but I, comfort. And it was weird with the way my glasses slid in. It's like the foam is really <laughs> stiff. So it pushed up against my glasses frames. Oh, that'd be uncomfortable. Yeah. It just wasn't a comfortable fit. So right. I was just bummed about it. So this would be probably, I, would this be the first product from wise that you would say, eh, yeah, well, yeah, I, I would. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'll tell you, it was funny, uh, Sean. I was in Walmart the other day, and I'm, whenever I go to Walmart, I'm that guy that always goes back to electronics. I always look to oh, see what, what do they got. What what what's the big thing here? You know, and they got gaming rigs. They've got some gaming laptops. They got some Chromebooks. You know, they have that. But I noticed something new. Uh, they actually have the Roku devices. 
which are basically, if you're there and you see the cameras, those are wise cameras. They did a partnership with Roku. And I saw an R on that, on your, your headphones there from Wise, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm wondering if they're going to brand them as Roku headphones. It's on the inner e- inside ear. Oh, that's just a left and a right. Oh, I saw the R. <laughs> One's Roku, the other's Loku. No, um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I noticed that they're branding now the Roku. Uh, they're, they're basically wise cameras, but branding it as Roku cameras yeah. in that partnership it, that they I mean, did. It makes sense. It's just another branding opportunity to reach into another market, right? So um, you saw them at Walmart. 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 I saw them at Home Depot. So they're selling the Roku. Because I know at Home Depot they sell the wise cams. But they're yeah, actually selling. I saw, the, the, I saw the Roku ones also, and then I also saw back not with the cameras and the other wise stuff, but back in the, I was looking for a light switch specifically. They had the wise switch. Oh, good. A single, a single wise switch available at Home Depot. Pleasantly, I was really surprised. I was like, wow, I didn't think that they had these there. Single pole wise switch, fourteen ninety seven. Now some so people might be going, switch? what is a what does a wise switch do? This. If if I'm not mistaken, it would give the ability to turn on and off a light with your smartphone that is that is plugged into a socket. Right. Everything with Wise is wireless. It's like, why right. wouldn't the Wise switch be able to be wireless wherever I want it to go? Well, it is. But the way it's designed is that it replaces a full, normal 120 volt switch. Oh boy. So that. When you press the button, it triggers a relay in that switch, and it can control the actual 120 volt circuit. Right. Right. That's not what I want. I didn't want that. I don't care. <laughs> I want to be able to just turn my lights on and off from my computer overhead. I can change them blue. I can change them white. So I bought the three pack when they were announced, and then I got them. I was like, I don't want to put this in. I don't want to have to wire up the whole thing. Yeah. So I sat on them for a handful of months. So then I saw somebody on the Wise Reddit had taken theirs apart and found out that well yeah there's a relay in there that converts the the 120 to 5 volt and it just powers the 5 volt board i cracked mine open found this is a very basic board and i i'm going to put together a, a little how i hacked my wise plug yeah cuz it has 5 volt leads right on the board so i just chopped up a usb cord grabbed a 5 volt power brick from you know an old cell phone wired it up plugged it in and I have access to my wise plug. So if I, if I do this, adjust the lights, turned off my wise bulbs that are behind me. You you can't see, you can't see it, but right. And you didn't have, and all that is is plugged in USB. And you didn't have to get up and grab your phone and do anything like that. Yeah. So then you can, you can trigger, uh, you can trigger lights, you can trigger actions, you can trigger, uh, rules, you can trigger all sorts of stuff. So I've got, one in down here, I've got one upstairs, and I've got one in my workshop. And what's cool about it is if, if I'm walking my upstairs and I forgot to turn my lights off downstairs, I do a long press, a long press on the one upstairs, and it turns off all the wise lights in the house. You should put that together. We could put that on our, our blog site, and people can check that out now. Yeah, and it's, you know, it, if it, it took me, it would, it would take you 10 minutes and $4 in parts. Did a lot of TV this week about something that's brand new. I'm going to play some audio for you to demonstrate the power of this software that's available. There's software that you can legally use and have some fun with. And then there's a dark side to it as well. And if you saw any of the TV segments, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. We'll do that when we come back. I'm Andy Taylor. I'm Sean DeWeird. Find us on the web at techtalkradio.com. And now back to Tech Talk Radio. During the uh, the break, what we did is uh, Sean went ahead and put on the new Wise gaming headset that has the microphone attached, and so you've got them on right now. And you say the sound is good. Yeah, so it sounds it sounds clear. It's uh, you know they're over the ear, so it, it kind of doesn't cancel the noise, but it's it's over the ear, so I can you know I can't hear my computer fans and stuff. But um, the microphone you- it does sound different, definitely. Yeah, I, I'm sure it would. It's a, you know, it's a just a different design totally. But um, now the hard no, part, it, the hard part about that though is when you're playing a game, you're not calm. It's, no, no, you absolutely know, not. The, you're you're playing a game. It's exciting. You're having uh, you know voice chat with other players that are on your team. So you're going to generally 
probably get a little more excited on that microphone, and that microphone is going to end up like cutting out. Yeah, so if I get really excited and talk really loud, you guys can probably hear it clipping maybe a little bit, or it gets, gets yeah. a little tinny, it gets kind of gross. So wasn't too thrilled about that. So, I mean, it's got to have a decent pickup. Otherwise, it's not it, – you can't – communication is key in gaming, right? You right. You can't, can't have me calling for support on my flank and then get shot or something, right? So – now you've traditionally been playing uh, some of the games that you play in your PC with the the microphone that you won, which is still pretty cool. But that microphone that we we used in the first segment of the show that's a microphone yeah. you use, right? Yeah. So the the one the one that I'm using normally is the is the Yeti Blue, the Blue mm -hmm. Yeti. This the one that I'm using now is not actually the one that I won in the giveaway. This is the World of Warcraft branded one. They had a deal on a World of Warcraft. You know, it's got cool glyphs on it it's got a cool stand i can do in-game voice sounds and make myself sound like an elf <laughs> or whatever right so the blue yeti mics are incredible and i recommend them for anybody that's looking at a decent entry-level microphone that they're willing to spend just over a hundred dollars for the blue yeti or the blue yeti nano are, and they're incredible microphones yeah the audio does definitely sound different but... so i'm gonna <laughs> just keep talking here and i'm gonna switch this live here so i'm gonna keep talking i'm gonna switch it back to the yeti and see if you guys can hear a difference all right so all right. now you guys can hear a big difference big difference in the audio on that and if you're gaming big you need to be audio. you need to sound louder you need to have that projection yeah so it just sounds so much cleaner and the benefit of having the yeti is i can use the logitech g hub the suite and to you know andy and i spent a good hour probably two years ago and tweaked my audio settings. So it sounded great and it sounded good and sounded crisp. And I got the bass in there and it just, so it doesn't sound like I'm talking through a tin can. Yeah. It does have a, a really good sound without processing. It has its own processing in the microphone, which is good. If you're looking for a microphone, you know, sometimes you go into Best Buy or, you know, you jump online, you try and find a microphone. Yeti is actually a really good line. And I do believe they're a part of Logitech. Yeah, um, Yeti got bought by Logitech probably, I want to say, 2018 maybe or even earlier than that. Um, but they've, they, they've been known, if you're in the recording industry or if you've done any live recording, the, the baby blue bottle, the uh -huh. baby bottle, the blue Yeti or the, the blue a, baby bottle. Yeah, it's a strange it's looking very, microphone. It's, it's very strange looking microphone, but it's a very popular uh, vocal recording microphone for, for musicians. Blue's not just some company that showed up during COVID and started spinning out microphones, right? They, they, they're a tried and true brand that just happens to make really good USB microphones now. So I got to tell you, um, this week I did a lot of television. Uh, and on the television, we were talking about scammers and some of the problems that uh, have started to pop up recently. If you have a smartphone and you get a text, from somebody that says, you know, where are you? I'm here. And it's got a link. You don't want to click on that link. Even if it comes from some number you may recognize, because what's happening now is a lot of uh, phishing is going on and social, you know, engineering to replicate a phone number, spoof a phone number, send you a link that could um, actually give up a lot of information on your smartphone that you don't want to have given up. And we've all had that text where, I don't know if you've had one, Sean, where it will say, hey, what time do you want to meet for dinner? And it's nobody you know. And oh, yeah. I, I get them once a week, probably. Yeah. And it shows up. And I usually mess with them. Well, it's probably not a good idea. I mean, yeah, I, I used to do it, too. And I would mess with them. But here's what's happening. They're generally sending these messages out to multiple numbers to find out who responds. Once you respond, they know it's a valid number. They're actually reaching somebody. They have no way of telling, in most cases, what platform you are on until you respond or knowing if they've reached a valid number at all. Could be a landline, could be a fax line. And no matter what, they just send the text out. Um, and that is a way of verifying it's a real number. The other thing that's happening now, and Sean, you know, we, we've talked about this before, um, for fun, deep fake technology, the deep fake technology that we've seen out there. And remember, Justin even did that with his high school photo where it animated a photo of himself. And then suddenly we got warnings. Don't be uploading your photos because it's it's a company that is m taking your photos. And, you know, and there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of people frightened at that and, you know, being afraid. And, 
you know, took away some of the fun that people were having on that when they were uploading photos to be adjusted. Well, people do it every day on Snap with their filters and the whole bit. However, what they have found now is that deep fake technology that we've seen in videos of Tom Cruise that looks like Tom Cruise, of other actors. Uh, there's a, uh, some great deep fakers out there that have taken Bill Hader. And while Bill Hader does great impressions, turned him into that celebrity with his, with his face. And it's really amazing. You find that on YouTube. But they've now harnessed not only the video, but now they're harnessing the audio. And it's pretty amazing stuff when you see how it's done. There's several websites now that will take audio of, well, they'll take, say you typing and you'll type a message and that message will then using AI technology then be used to create that voice using that celebrity's, that celebrity's voice. You can also now with, and one of them I've been playing around with is uh, voice.ai on the web. The only thing I don't like about it is where others are web-based for you to play around with and have some fun with. This one, you download a program into your computer and it will launch in your startup. You have to go in and physically tell it not to. But what is pretty amazing is the quality that you get out of this. They have about over 10,000 different voices available. Some of it, just everyday, you know, people. Uh, others are celebrities from Schwarzenegger to Donald Trump to President Joe Biden. And you say something, it takes that and it turns the, using artificial intelligence, basically turns it into that person's voice. I'll give you an example. I did this one earlier today uh, and I'm hoping you, you'll be able to hear this. This is supposedly President Biden, but listen how good it took about 15 seconds for this to render. Well, when I need to get the latest in tech, I listen to Justin and Sean and Andy on Tech Talk Radio. Voice.ai. It's pretty amazing. They watermark it. Now, uh, if you were to pay for the service, it can be kind of pricey. Almost 200 and I believe 75 bucks a year for you to be able to have that. And then one of the other features they have on uh voice.ai is live. So if you're wearing a headphone and you've got, like you have, Sean, that microphone that's off that headphone, you can then take it and doing live, have it recreate that voice. So as you're speaking to that person, so as I'm talking right here, it would suddenly be, and I, I don't have the capabilities to do this through our system right now, but it would be able to then change that. And the scary part about that is AI can learn a voice in a short amount of time. If you were to take, say, somebody calls you and you say, hey, is Joe there? And you say, I don't know, Joe. That's a piece of audio. Uh, if they call back at some point and they say, hey, uh, uh, is this so-and-so? And you say, no, it's another piece of audio. Uh, somebody calls you on the phone and they know your name and they say, is this uh, John? And you say, yes, this is. How are you doing? I'm doing good. That well, over time they can connect, collect enough audio from you that they can recreate your voice. So somebody using that live feature could call and say, "Hey, mom, I'm stuck. I need some help. Can you wire me some money?" So it's a new way of phishing. It's a new way of scamming this voice AI technology, and you need to be really aware of that. While Pima County sheriffs uh, in the story that we did said they haven't really seen any cases of it, you're not necessarily going to see these all the time because some people don't check it out. They don't, you know, they get the phone call saying we need you to send gift cards, et cetera. They don't take that extra step to follow through and find out if that person is You just really got to be trouble. suspicious of anybody asking you for money. Anytime. Even if somebody you know. You get a link. You get an email. You get, you know, somebody calling you now. You have to be questioning. Just say, hey, I'm busy. Let me call you back. So, again, just be really careful. And I've just avoided all of the AI stuff. I don't know. I just. But it's out know. there. It is, and I see it, I read about it, but I I just don't, it's not something I'm interested in playing around with. Yeah. You know, I, I've, I've, I've had so many people say, oh, it's so easy, it's so much fun to just pop in a random question and see what it pops up with. Yeah. Well, well we, sure. we, had, we had an instant, instance, because, you know, you've got ChatGPT, which is popular. We talked about it on uh, a couple of weeks ago, 
And then you've got uh, Bing Chat AI, which is available now. Bing Bing has crossed over a million users daily again, which nobody was using Bing. I mean, well, some people were, I guess. Most people use Google Chrome or Edge. Well, they're now using Bing as the search engine because once you go to Bing.com, if you scroll up, you get the Bing Chat AI. It's now also an app on your smartphone that you can use. But I'll, I'll tell you what happened, Sean. It was kind of interesting. I asked it. Tell me about Tech Talk Radio on Bing Chat AI. And it showed my logo and it started telling the story of Justin, Sean, you know, you, Michael Bryan, Bill Grace, who, you know, we started the show with back in the 90s. And then it started talking about these hosts I've never heard of before that I found out are part of uh, another show that calls himself Tech Talk, uh, that is a Stanford education, I guess, in the same info. So, Sean, what did I do? I went to Bing Chat AI back and I, I typed a message saying, you have the wrong information about, you know, Tech Talk Radio. I'd love to provide the correct information to you. You know what the response was? Please send her the right information. No. The response was, I feel you're being confrontational. I must end this <laughs> chat at this time. <laughs> it was wanting an argument from me. It wanted to end the conversation because it thought rather than me helping it, that I was being confrontational about it. And this is just typing a message. It's pretty amazing. And, you know, and I had another discussion the other day about something and it just kept going on bothering me. I just wanted one answer and I kept, so do you like that? Is that your favorite food? Have you ever tried this? It was really kind of strange as it's learning more about the people that are using it. I just think it's weird. (laughs) <laughs> I it is. I know that people have uses for it, but I just I don't see myself randomly putting stuff. I don't know. It's yeah. Weird. And again, you you put into it what you're going to get out of it, and some people are putting up 15 minutes of their voice to different uh, different of these uh, AI chat servers, and you have to think about that. There's a lot of good ones out there, but again, how do you want to use it? Some gamers are using it. Discord, you see that on Discord quite a bit now. The people are playing the game as a celebrity. Stallone or yeah. whatnot. No, yeah. I mean, you're seeing it all over the place, right? And it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's one of those things that just too much. Too much, and too I, quick. Too much, too quick. It's everywhere. It's all anybody's talking about. And I'm, it's weird. I think it's weird. Yeah. I'm not, I, I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to go out of my way to use it. I'm not going to use it to generate stories or right. generate scripts or generate content for any of my D and D games or anything like that, because that, takes it away from the whole experience. Exactly. Exactly. So that's my five cents on it. All right. We, a couple weeks ago, actually January 30th of this year, Tucson Unified School District was hit with that, um, uh, that ransomware attack from Royal, the group calling themselves Royal. And we talked with Mike Letman from CISA. It was a great guest. You can find that interview up on our website, talking about, you know, security and ransomware and what that all means. There's a company out there called Raxco Software, R-A-X-C-O. And I talked with uh, Mr. Nolan, the CEO of the company, about the software that they have and why this is good for educational establishments, but also small to medium to large business should be looking at their software as a backup solution to help in case your system is ever ransomware. So we're going to be talking with him coming up next, and then we'll be back with more of Tech Talk Radio. Now, back to Tech Talk Radio. Well, back in January of uh, this year, Uh, There was a terrible situation for TUSD, uh, Tucson Unified School District. And with that, a ransomware attack was perpetrated on them by Royal. Now, the downsides to any attack like this is what information gets out, but also is to get them back up to speed. And with an educational institution, uh, it's uh, very important because it's day-to-day operations during a school year. Uh, We've seen uh, hospitals, we've seen banks, we've seen Private companies, large and small, being uh, affected by ransomware attacks. And the hard thing is to really get that data back. And uh, with us on the line is Bob Nolan, who is the CEO of Raxco Software based in Maryland. And uh, Bob has worked on solutions uh, with the company, of course, to some of these attacks and bringing that, you know, bringing those systems back online. Bob, I want to thank you for coming on Tech Talk Radio. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Andy. Tell us a little bit about Raxco Software. Uh, this is a company that actually 
pretty much got its starts back in the 70s. Uh, that's right. The company was founded in about 1978. Uh, at that time, uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, if you remember them, oh, yeah. uh, they came out with the first 32-bit processor that was for time sharing. And there was a, a niche created there for system management tools, and Raxco took advantage of that. Uh, so the origins were with uh, the digital platform. We grew to be the largest third-party provider of uh, system tools for that. And then in the 1990s, the company diversified into Unix and ultimately Windows software as well. Now, we have seen uh, attacks like uh, like the one that TUSD went uh, increasing when it comes to educational uh, systems. Why, why do they seem to go after them? Well, there's a couple reasons. First and foremost, uh, schools uh, and, and other organizations that are in that same kind of top five tier targets, uh, schools, local governments, hospitals. Uh, uh, certainly for schools and, and local governments, uh, they don't always have the budgets to have the top tier hardware and software that you might need to uh, prevent an attack. And a uh, secondary consideration is they may not have the budgets to attract top level security personnel mm -hmm. that could both manage that software and know where the uh, vulnerabilities might be. Certainly for schools, it's an opportunity to get personal data uh, on kids who may not have a uh, credit rating uh, yet or a credit mm -hmm. track record. So if they can pick up the right kind of personal information, that can be exploited. And that's the scary part about that is finding out just how deep it goes. But again, the importance is to be able to bring the systems back online. Uh, I saw some data that uh, you had shared with me that in 2021, over a thousand schools in the U.S. were disrupted by ransomware. Uh, and, you know, the idea is really you, you don't want to have to pay some of these these people who are holding, you know, and asking for a ransom, you want to get your systems back online. But the thing is, what information has been on there? So the best way to do that is re kind of bring them back to pre-attack conditions. And that's possible with software that Rasco has developed. That's right. Uh, what our instant recovery software does is it allows you to re quickly restore the system uh, back to the way it was before the attack. Uh, when you have a ransomware attack, certainly there's ways to test to see if a machine is infected, but there might be a lot of machines where you don't know, but you have to assume that the machine is infected. So you, you need to get that, either t find a way to get the ransomware off, or more likely uh, you reinstall Windows and the applications that are on that machine. Uh, unfortunately, the way we traditionally do that for workstations, and we've talked to companies and uh, government agencies that have thousands of workstations. The traditional way to restore that is very, very slow. It's called re-imaging and, mm -hmm. and involves pushing out the information that you want to have on the machine. Where our instant recovery product is a little different is what we do is we take a snapshot of the system drive and we keep that snapshot in a hidden and protected folder on the system drive. Oh. So you have this exact copy of your system right there locally. So if ransomware hits, uh, by the way, instant recovery is the only thing that can write to that folder. Right. So if ransomware hits, it's not going to affect the folder where our recovery snapshot is. So uh, if you have to restore these systems, you can literally go out and tell instant recovery, boot to that recovery snapshot, and then the time it takes to reboot, it will restore exactly what was there. So... The good news of that is you can restore quickly to the recovery snapshot. The bad news is your original system is still infected. Yeah. So with instant recovery, you can say copy the recovery snapshot to the infected system, and it will index both of them and copy over anything that uh, needs to be changed. And in a few minutes, you can actually repair the infected system as well. Yeah, because this brings down the fact that uh, ransomware sometimes can be, you know, uh, installed on a system, you know, months before the actual full attack is kind of implemented. This is kind of a way to bring that back and write over that so that, um, you know, any, any, pro any information that is still lurking would be written over. We're taking a snapshot at a point in time. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if you take servers, for example, uh, most servers today are virtual, and the recovery mechanism is often a system that takes frequent system snapshots. However, as you mentioned, if the uh, 
ransomware is lurking on the system for weeks or months, those snapshots are also infected because they're replicating the, the ransomware. Got so it. what we recommend in an instance like that, we call it a kind of a belt and suspenders approach. Because most companies have to rely on those frequent snapshots, that's fine. It may not get infected. But if it does, if you have an instant recovery static snapshot there that you take when you assume that the system is good and you don't change it, uh, if your primary system gets infected, you know that you have a known good snapshot somewhere. It may not be up to date, but it's still going to be faster to boot to that uh, static snapshot and then apply any Windows or application updates. That'll be faster than reinstalling Windows, reinstalling the applications, and then having to do all the updates as well. Yeah, that's that's probably the most time-consuming, and of course, can cost tens of thousands of dollars, if not more. Now, one of the use case scenarios, and I would love if uh, TUSD and some of our educational institutions here in Arizona would look at this, because this, again, can save time, but one of them that you did was in Pennsylvania, and you provided instant recovery for you know, the processes there. Uh, yeah, instant, uh, Pennsylvania has kind of a unique uh, st- situation. Uh, the state is divided into 21 regions called intermediate units. And those intermediate units provide technical and uh, educational, extra educational uh, support to the schools that are within their region. Uh, it happens that one of those regions in central Pennsylvania has been sort of the uh, the leader for negotiating software contracts, and then they turn around and resell and promote the software to Pennsylvania's 564 school districts. Mm-hmm. So we were fortunate enough to be able to engage with uh, one of these uh, intermediate units, and we've now put together a contract with them, and they are uh, going out and, uh, like I said, promoting instant recovery. And we did that because we have their assistance in this and they have access to those schools uh we're able to do this for them for about 65 percent off the msrp nice now we know that you know there are some great minds that work in it at uh, tusc and of course this this can happen um does does a maybe smaller school district that would want to have something like this or a company that has somebody that is kind of the point person when it comes to it can they set this up pretty easily uh, yeah, Instant Recovery is uh, a standard MSI install, and you can deploy it with whatever software you use to deploy. And pretty much anything you see on the product GUI can be scripted as well. So you can make it do whatever you want it to do. Now, how how do you expand it? Now we've you know we've got Windows Server 2022, Windows 11 uh, for you know your servers for your desktop PCs. Um, do you have a wide range of products to handle the small business as well that they'd be able to utilize this product for both business and consumers? Yes, we do. I mean, the, there's a workstation and server version of the product, um, and the pricing for it is, is affordable. That's something that we've always kept in mind. Uh, and then on the consumer side, we also have a consumer version of the product. Bob, how can our listeners find out more information about the company? And for those IT managers that would want to get more info about this, what should they do? They could uh, contact our uh, sales organization at sales at com, or they can uh, contact us at uh, by phone as well. The phone number there is 301 in Maryland. Five two seven zero eight zero three. And again, a good look at the uh, the website again at raxco.com. Give you a, a wide breadth of the different products that are available. A lot of us remember Perfect Disk, Perfect Storage, uh, and now Instant Recovery. Going to be very important as we move forward, as we're seeing again an uptick on some of the attacks because you know it's it, they're hopefully you know looking for the quick buck. Uh, maybe they don't want the data that's a part of it, but you have to worry about that too. But again, this can get you up to speed and maybe find out where some of those those holes were in the system that maybe allowed it. Yeah, instant recovery, well, we say it saves time, money, and reputations. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it helps you get the system back, but you can still preserve systems for forensic data and do any analysis that you want uh, to find out where your vulnerabilities it might be. We just get your Windows and application environment back up so that data recovery can start faster. And presumably once your network's up, your user community can actually access that data because we've had clients where uh, 
they've had a systemic attack. They got their servers back up and they're started their data restoration, but they had 500 infected desktops and that was going to take two weeks yeah. to, to recover. So yeah. having a backup solution is the smartest thing in the world and one that can get you up to speed and looks uh, seriously uh, like instant recovery is going to be the, the best way to do that. I want to thank you, Bob, for coming on Tech Talk Radio and telling us about it. Again, we hope our listeners take a look at Raxco, R-A-X-C-O dot com for more info. Okay, thank you for the time, Andy. Appreciate it. Some great software that could certainly help you out if you're ever the victim of a ransomware attack. But really, the key, honestly, is not to have this installed after an attack. This is something you want to be proactive with to, again, give you that added peace of mind, that layer of protection that when it comes time and you need to restore your systems, as with anything, you want to be proactive, not reactive when it comes to your digital security. But again, a wide breadth of products available at Raxco.com. Uh, we're going to come back with more of Tech Talk Radio, our website of the week. And Sean will kind of explain to us a little more of how he has uh, found the love again for amateur radio. Some good stuff as well. And we'll have more of that. Now, don't forget, you can find us on the World Wide Web at techtalkradio.com, on Twitter at Tech Talk Radio. And of course, check out our YouTube page and subscribe to the Tech Talk Radio channel up on YouTube. Uh, and you'll find that a uh, link from our website. And now, back to Tech Talk Radio. Well, as well as getting into, you know, back into um, uh, printing, 3D printing, you've kind of jumped a little bit back into, um, you know, radio uh, as far as, you know, amateur radio. Yeah, so I I never really stopped, right? But I've been studying for my general exam. Uh, I have been a part of the Ham Radio Club on campus at Notre Dame. So I've kind of just been get encouraged to study for my general exam. Right. So I'm all, I'm only a technician right now, which is fine. Uh, but I want to get into doing some of the uh, 40 and 80 meter HF stuff, which is only in the ge- available the general license. So right. I've been wanting to do that. Uh, but in the meantime, if I want to listen on HF or if I want to listen, uh, Ham Radio Crash Course is a YouTube channel that uh, I follow pretty heavily. And they do a, a what they call an HF net every week, every Friday. Mm-hmm. And I don't have an HF antenna on my house. So if I want to listen, I have to find a, a way to do that, right? So I go to WebSDR.org, W-E-B-S-D-R.org. What that stands for is Web Software Defined Radio. So if you go to WebSDR.org, you're going to find this huge list of all these locations around the world. And you're going to see all these frequencies. And it's going to be very confusing probably, right? Right. What, what it is is that I could take a signal from my antenna at my house and get it into my computer and then create a virtual radio that you can then view at your house and listen to the frequencies that are coming from my antenna. And you could then tune my antenna to whatever frequency it's set up for. So if I wanted to listen to the HFR net, the H the internet, the HF net uh, on Friday nights, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, right? You're gonna there you're gonna see a map of the world. And, and then you can zoom in and you can you can zoom in and find where people have, have these uh this this software running, and then you can click in and see more. And I can go and I can go, mm, I'm gonna go to this one in Ohio and I'm gonna tune it up. And I'm going to listen on, for, you know, a frequency and you can go in and see the waterfall and I'm going to show it to you guys here so you can see it. So right now, this is a, where is this one at? This one's in somewhere in Ohio. Right. And these are the frequencies here that you can see. If you can see this, this is what called, they call a waterfall. So this is a, a live view of the radio spectrum. And these really bright spots are full fledged radio frequencies that are, I can, I can click on here, and I can tune this. Oh, okay, and I, great. And I can and I can tune the radio to the frequency that they're doing the HF net on, and listen and see if the that it's being picked up by that antenna. All over the world, amazing. You can do this all all over the world. It's 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 incredible. So if you're interested at all in shortwave radio, UHF, VHF, HF, all that. You can webstr.org, just go in there and play around with it. It's incredible. It's so much fun. And you don't have to have the equipment on your house to do it. Excellent. Webstr.org. That wraps up this week's Tech Talk Radio. Hopefully, uh, Justin will be joining us next week. 
In the meantime, I'm Andy Taylor. I'm Sean DeWeird. Find us on Twitter at Tech Talk Radio.